Uh, first, my gratitude to Mark and to the organizing committee for the invitation, indeed the privilege of speaking with you this morning. Uh, I will uh, tell you about work done along three lines. Uh, first, uh, some of the history of the work uh, to orient you in respect to the more recent findings. Uh, in the middle of the lecture, I'll give you a very specific example uh, which may uh, be of particular interest to those who study transcription, which is the main topic of my lecture. Uh, it will, I hope, not be too detailed uh, for the more general audience and some of the chemists in other fields. And at the end, I'd like to tell you about some of our recent findings, uh, as yet unpublished, indeed, uh, still many months from publication, but uh, which interest me particularly and will give you at least a general idea of where the field is going. Now, I'd also like at the outset to acknowledge the contributions from my colleagues at Stanford to the work I'll describe. So if I may have the first slide. The uh, second part of the lecture, which uh, refers to some of the work uh, that is more detailed and relating specifically to transcription, was done uh, by Dave Bushnell, by Shin Lu, uh, and by Yale Lorch. Uh, and then the last part of the lecture, which deals with the work still in progress, uh, owes to the contributions of Maya Azubel, Guillermo Calero, Ralph Davis, Hans Elmland, Brian Gibbons, Pablo Jadzinski, Kenji Murakami, and Phil Robinson. I'll call specific attention to their contributions as we go along. Now, the, uh, the work really began, as Mark has already indicated, with the discovery of the nucleosome, the basic unit of coiling DNA in eukaryote chromosomes. And when I put forward the idea of the nucleosome in 1974, it was already apparent that wrapping of DNA around a set of eight histone molecules in the nucleosome would interfere with many DNA interactions, including transcription. Indeed, about 10 years later, uh, Yale Lorch and I uh, were able to show that wrapping a promoter of a gene in a nucleosome would prevent the initiation of transcription. Uh, very soon after, Michael Grunstein and colleagues at UCLA uh, demonstrated, a, demonstrated a similar inhibitory effect of the nucleosome upon transcription in yeast cells in vivo, from which we know the nucleosome serves as a general gene repressor. Uh, it prevents expression of all the many thousands of genes in eukaryotes except those whose transcription is brought about by specific positive regulatory mechanisms. And the work over the more than uh, 25 years since that time uh, has been devoted to the elucidation of those mechanisms. Uh, much has been learned, uh, and I'll only be able to tell you, I should say, give a capsule summary of the work uh, during that intervening time. It was at first thought that uh, the histones were simply removed from promoters to enable transcription. That was based on the discovery that promoter DNA was especially available for cleavage by nucleases and attack by chemical reagents uh, when a gene was in undergoing transcription. Uh, then later, uh, as a result of what is called chromatin immunoprecipitation studies performed with antibodies directed against the histones, it emerged the histones are still present on the promoters of genes undergoing transcription only in an extensively modified, chemically modified form, from which it came to be believe the histones are not removed at all, but rather altered and the nucleosome itself trans transformed in structure uh, to relieve the inhibition of transcription. Most recently, uh, about 10 years ago, my colleagues Boger and Griesenbeck uh, discovered that uh, neither of those previous views was entirely correct nor entirely mistaken, uh, rather than think in terms of the removal of histones from a promoter to enable transcription, what Boger and Griesenbeck could show is that uh, promoter chromatin is transformed from a static to a dynamic state in which nucleosomes are continually removed and reassembled. Uh, they showed that uh, the occupancy of a promoter might be on average nearly, by a nucleosome, might be on average nearly 100% nearly when a gene is transcribed. Nevertheless, that DNA is made transiently available in a naked form uh, 
due to this dynamic characteristic, and it is in that naked state that it can interact with the transcription machinery. Now, our work has focused on the RNA polymerase II transcription machinery for a reason that is doubtless well known uh, to many of you. This is the enzyme responsible for all messenger RNA synthesis in eukaryotes. RNA polymerase II transcription is the first step in the pathway of gene expression uh, and is thus a focal point of cellular regulation. Uh, it is the end point of a great many signal transduction pathways. Uh, it is the intricate regulation of RNA polymerase II transcription that underlies cell differentiation and development. We and others, most notably Robert Rader and his colleagues and also Ronald and Joan Conaway, uh, pursued the components of the RNA polymerase II transcription machinery uh, during the course of the 1980s. Uh, we all arrived at the end of that decade uh, at the identification of the set of molecules that is minimally required for the initiation of transcription. These include, in addition to the RNA polymerase, five more proteins that are known as general transcription factors and which go by the letter names B, D, E, F, and H. RNA polymerase alone is capable of unwinding the DNA double helix. Lost the pointer here. Do you have a backup pointer by any chance? Uh, RNA polymerase alone, as the slide indicates, is capable of unwinding the DNA double helix and the initiation, I, I should say, and the uh, synthesis of an RNA molecule. But the polymerase alone is not capable of recognizing a promoter in duplex DNA, nor of the initiation of an RNA chain. And it is for those essential functions that the general transcription factors are required. Um, I will give you a bit of background. Thank you very much. I will give you a bit of background uh, about the polymerase and then go on to speak in more detail about the roles of the general factors. It was at first thought that this set of molecules is not only necessary for promoter recognition and the initiation of transcription, but also sufficient for a response to the regulatory influences to which I referred and which form much of the basis for our interest in the process. There were many proofs for direct interaction of uh, regulatory proteins with RNA polymerase II and the general factors published in the late 1980s. Nevertheless, my colleagues Kelleher and Flanagan uh, discovered in the early 1990s that an additional protein is required for a response, for example, to a gene activator protein uh, to provoke the initiation of transcription. Uh, in 1994, my colleagues Kim and Bjorklund succeeded in uh, resolving mediator to homogeneity as a 21 protein complex greater than a million molecular weight, uh, which uh, we now know uh, is the primary conduit for regulatory information from both gene activator and G gene repressor proteins to the transcription machinery. The uh, well-known aphorism often attri attributed to uh, Francis Crick uh, now, I think, uh, is unavoidably uh, the uh, point of departure for the rest of what I have to tell you. Uh, Francis is supposed to have said, if you wish to understand function, study structure. Indeed, from what I have just explained, uh, what was accomplished by the beginning of the 1990s was a description of the transcription machinery, a naming of the components of the machinery. But uh, at that point, still only a limited understanding of the process itself, its mechanism, and ultimately the basis for gene regulation. In order to pursue uh, those important questions, uh, we then investigated the structure of the apparatus, the architecture, and ultimately the near atomic structure of the machinery. And the remainder of what I have to tell you will be 
uh, about the progress we've made along those lines. We began with the structure of RNA polymerase, itself an assembly of a dozen proteins, uh, and uh, already a formidable challenge for structural studies. Uh, as you have, uh, may have heard, or many of you will doubtless be aware, uh, around the year 2000, we succeeded finally in the solution of the uh, X-ray crystal structure of RNA polymerase II, uh, and I will uh, spend a few minutes to review that information by way of introduction to the more recent findings uh, for the remainder of the lecture. The next slide will show the actual uh, atomic structure of the RNA polymerase in the form of a ribbon diagram, uh, each of the many subunits of the enzyme in a different color. So what you see here uh, is a view of the molecule here down the central cleft, here from one side, and then we will rotate back to a view from what we call the top, and this will be the direction of view for the remainder or most of the slides that I show you. Uh, as I say, each of the constituent polypeptides in a different color. Uh, the one that is here at the lower left, colored red, uh, is the fifth largest subunit, as it were, a typical 25,000 Dalton protein, which gives a sense of the scale, and you can appreciate the complexity of the structure. Uh, the pink sphere in the middle uh, shows the location of a magnesium ion that serves a, an important function in catalysis of RNA synthesis and marks the location of the active center. Now, we know where DNA enters and the product RNA exits from the structure from our separate determination of the molecule in the form of an actively transcribing complex also by X-ray crystallography. And uh, in the second of the slides to follow, I'll actually, I'll, I'll show you that structure. Uh, it will be uh, a view down the central axis where uh, I mentioned in the course of this uh, animation. Before doing so, I'd like to emphasize uh, and present a kind of color code to what follows. So it had been known for many years that uh, the double-stranded DNA is unwound in the form of a so-called transcription bubble at the active center of RNA polymerases engaged in transcription. Uh, some 15 base pairs of duplex DNA and wound in that form. It was also known from biochemical studies some eight to nine uh, base pairs of DNA, of RNA DNA hybrid are centered within the bubble with the growing end of the RNA uh, adjacent to the catalytic magnesium ion, three residues from the single-strand duplex DNA junction. Now, in this slide and the ones to follow, the strand of the DNA that directs RNA synthesis is blue, the opposite strand of the DNA, the so-called non-template strand, green, and the RNA will always be red. The next slide will, is a movie which shows you uh, the structure of the transcribing complex. And it's a movie made of only two frames. It's produced by an alternation between those two frames. And each of the frames is an actual crystal structure. And as I say, it will be a view down that central axis of the RNA polymerase. So here you see then uh, that movie. And what will be apparent is that the DNA in blue and green and the RNA in red occupy the central channel. So I'll go back again just to emphasize the point. Here the central channel uh, and the DNA in blue and green occupy that space on the enzyme surface. Uh, the uh, element, the massive element of protein density uh, that receives contributions from four different protein subunits, which is colored gold, uh, you may have noticed swings over the DNA and the RNA in the course of forming a transcribing complex. And for that reason, uh, we refer to it as a clamp, and it will be an important landmark in the slides to follow. Now, you may have noticed that the axis of the entering DNA double helix uh, is at nearly right angles to the axis of the exiting RNA-DNA hybrid helix, and that is because of what we refer to as a wall of protein density that blocks straight passage of nucleic acids through the polymerase cleft. 
That wall, which will be colored blue in some of the slides to follow, is another useful landmark to the structure. Now, pursuing what is shown here over the last decade, we've learned much about the mechanism of transcription. We've learned how the enzyme selects the correct nucleoside triphosphate for entry in the addition site and for joining to the growing RNA strand. We've learned how mistakes that may be made in that selection process are corrected. We've learned how the enzyme translocates uh, along the nucleic acid in the course of transcription. We've learned how the RNA is peeled off the template DNA strand for release into solution. I won't speak about any of those aspects of transcription this morning. The work is published. Uh, I can refer anyone who would like uh, to uh, the appropriate uh, references. What I'd like to do in the time that remains today is tell you about our studies of the polymerase in association with the many additional components that I introduced at the outset. The general transcription factors which are required for promoter recognition and for initiating the synthesis of an RNA chain, uh, the point where the first and still principal regulation of the process occurs. Uh, I'll allude only briefly to the role of mediator as a conduit of regulatory information. Uh, that's work, uh, the burden of which will still lie in the future. Now, uh, in regard to the roles of the general factors, I will give you one specific example, uh, that of the first of the general factors, factor B. Uh, I'll mention later on the remaining factors, D, E, F, and H, but I'll focus especially by way of example on our structural studies of polymerase uh, interaction with general factor B. Uh, it will illustrate how much is to be gained from the atomic or near atomic detail of such an interaction regarding the mechanism of the overall process catalyzed by a very large assembly of protein molecules. Uh, and really pose the challenge for the work to follow. Uh, the work on factor B uh, was begun by my colleague Bushnell, uh, published in 2004, and a sequel to that work uh, from my colleague Shin Lu and my former colleague Patrick Cromer, uh, published in 2009. Again, I'm going to review uh, these findings because I think they are both illustrative of the value of information at near atomic resolution for understanding the mechanism of such a complex process and because they really set the stage for the remainder of what I have to say this morning, uh, mostly about unpublished work. Now, the uh, crystal structure of polymerase in a complex with factor B solved by Bushnell revealed different information from that of a complex of factor B with polymerase solved by Lewin Cromer. The crystals were obtained under slightly different solution conditions, showing that uh, the, uh, the work in 2004 and that published in 2009 uh, revealed uh, two conformational states of the complex, very similar in energy, uh, and as I will mention later on, enabling a switch between the states important uh, for a key event in the transcription initiation process. Now, I'll begin actually with the more recent structure, that of Lew and Cromer, and if time permits, uh, return to the Bushnell structure. Uh, the uh, Lew and Cromer structure showed a portion of the amino terminus, and especially uh, a portion of the C terminal part of the molecule, including one of the two so called cyclin repeat domains of the molecule. The work of Bushnell, uh, Bushnell was complementary. It showed more of the amino terminus, but none of the C-terminal region. In particular, the work of Bushnell revealed a feature we call the B-finger uh, that plays a key role in the recognition of the promoter and the transcription initiation process. So beginning then with the work of Lou and uh, I would acknowledge similar studies by Patrick Cromer and his colleagues, uh, what you see here is now once more the RNA polymerase, as I showed you already, viewed from the direction I said was the top of the enzyme, and the only difference from what I showed you before, here you see a, uh, a surface representation where previously I showed you a ribbon diagram of the polymerase structure. 
Uh, here's the clamp in gold color. Here is the wall in blue. The DNA enters from the left in this direction of view, and the RNA exits, as it were, from the top coming straight out at you. Now, what we see is that on the right-hand side is the electron density map determined by Shin Lu in green mesh for factor B, uh, the C-terminal region of factor B as it happens in a complex with RNA polymerase II. Uh, and then in red you see a trace of the polypeptide chain drawn through the electron density map uh, with confirmation from uh, anomalous, so-called anomalous difference uh, peaks from selenomethionine residues incorporated in various mutant forms of the protein uh, to verify the conclusion. Uh, what you see on the left is a ribbon diagram of the chain trace in red, and it shows you that factor B lies on top of the polymerase in the complex formed between them, between the clamp and the wall. Now, uh, some time, and I should say directly above the active center where the RNA emerges. Now, some time ago, uh, Sigler and uh, Burley and their colleagues, uh, I should say first Burley and later Sigler, uh, but from the work of the two groups, uh, uh, we learned uh, between 1990 and the year 2000 uh, about the structure of a complex of a fragment of factor B a C-terminal fragment of B, um, a part of the so-called Tata box binding protein, or TBP, which is a component of general factor D, and a small piece of DNA that includes the so-called Tata sequence. What uh, Burley, Signer, and their colleagues discovered is shown here on the right. Uh, factor B is, again, the C-terminal fragment of B is in red. The Tata box binding protein is in purple, and the DNA, as in the previous slides, is in cyan and green, or blue and green. Uh, what the structure determined by Burley and Sigler showed is that the bit of Tata box, or Tata sequence containing DNA, is sharply bent in the structure, as indicated by the arrows which show the direction of the DNA double helix on one side and the other of the complex. Now you may notice that there is a good correspondence of these alpha helices of the factor B fragment in the Burley Sigler structure with the alpha helices in our factor B RNA polymerase II co-crystal structure. Indeed, the two can be perfectly superimposed and on that basis, the Burley Sigler structure uh, incorporate in or docked to the factor B polymerase structure. So now we see not only the location of factor B, but also of the Tata pro binding protein and the Tata box DNA in relation to the structure. If we extend the ends of the Tata box DNA, so first here in uh, space filling or surface representation rather than a ribbon diagram. Now if we extend the ends of the Tata box DNA fragment with straight or canonical B form DNA double helix, we obtain what is shown here. Uh, and then just to rotate around uh, to come back to that direction of view that I showed before of the enzyme, uh, as I say, from the top. Uh, what we have, uh, what we obtain in this way is as it were, a model of what can be called the closed transcription initiation complex, closed because the DNA is all in duplex form, not yet opened or unwound to produce the transcription bubble needed for the initiation of transcription. Now, in most, and I should again emphasize that in this model, uh, the DNA actually extends a, just uh, atop. It's, it lies directly above the cleft uh, through which we previously found it enters in a transcribing complex. It's about 30 angstroms above the base of the cleft, the channel through which it passes in a transcribing complex. Now, in most promoters, uh, the Tata box is located approximately 30 base pairs, 
thought box here, 30 base pairs upstream from the start side of transcription. Also in most promoters, unwinding to produce a transcription bubble to allow the initiation of transcription begins about 11 base pairs upstream from the start site at plus one. Now, I'll just return to a ribbon representation and then rotate around uh, to give you a view similar to what I showed before of the crystal structure of a transcribing complex. And having done so, compare this model of the closed, closed complex to the actual structure that I showed before of the transcribing complex. This picture of a transcribing complex differs from what I showed you before only in being flipped 180 degrees so the DNA is entering from the left rather than what I showed you before where the DNA entered from the right. Now then, if we superimpose the two, come to what is shown here, this is the path of the DNA in the model of a closed promoter complex. This is the path of the DNA in the actual structure of a transcribing complex with the transcription bubble located in the active center and the RNA as it emerges uh, from the site of synthesis. Uh, at this point, I'll just break the DNA at the point where unwinding begins and remove uh, this portion of the DNA double helix and join the template strand to simulate the process of transcription bubble formation. Uh, and that produces what you see here. Whoops, sorry. So now all we've done, as I say, is to remove the portion of DNA uh, from the closed complex and replace it with that in the open complex, joining the strands uh, to get an idea of how the process of, to give a, a picture of how the process of transcriptional form, bubble formation might occur. And I'll just pursue the point in a bit more detail uh, with the following observation. Uh, the linker between the carboxy terminal portion of factor B and the N terminal portion and the RNA polymerase enclose a space that we refer to as the factor B tunnel. And now if we return to imagining that process of bubble formation, what you can understand is that as it uh, begins and the first few residues of single-stranded DNA emerge uh, from the point marked here at 11 residues upstream from the transcription start site, the tunnel will serve to guide the growing single-stranded region of the bubble towards the active center. And thus, uh, we can understand, I think, at least in conceptual terms, for the first time, how the DNA may find its way from this location 30 angstroms above the surface of the polymerase tunnel to the active center uh, for the initiation of transcription. Now, I should emphasize that this is the, 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 what I showed you, what I told you about the closed promoter complex is only a model based upon limited structural information. Uh, and likewise, what I have told you about the mechanism unwinding also uh, something we can uh, imagine or intuit, uh, but which has not been directly demonstrated. Uh, I will return uh, in the last part of my lecture to evidence to support uh, the idea the closed uh, promoter model is correct. It is actually the form that occurs in the complete complex with all the general factors and is truly the basis for the initiation of transcription. Uh, and in the interest of time, I'm just going to skip over the part about the Bushnell structure and come directly uh, to uh, a summary of recent results uh, concerning the factor B RNA polymerase complex and the initiation of transcription uh, before concluding with the recent unpublished work that I promised to do about the a role of the closed promoter complex and the entire process. So uh, I want to mention briefly uh, about uh, studies that uh, you can read in the recent literature published just a few months ago uh, concerning the structure of the initial transcribing complex. Uh, we made the surprising finding that in the very beginning of transcription, there is no protein contact with RNA. 
Uh, so uh, one might have thought that when the first few residues are assembled to form an RNA, of mo an RNA molecule of length two or three or four residues, when the RNA-DNA hybrid is very unstable and will tend to dissociate and the RNA be lost, that the protein would assist in retaining that small bit of RNA at the active center. What we discovered is the opposite, that the protein avoids all contact with the RNA. Uh, it might have done so, and there is evidence from literature how it would have done so. Nature obviously preferred to, to destabilize the early transcribing complex, in consequence of which um, it has long been known that there are repeated failed attempts at transcription before successful initiation occurs. A process of abortive initiation uh, is repeated many times over prior to the successful initiation of RNA synthesis. Uh, and it occurred to me uh, a while ago that on this basis, uh, one may view abortive initiation as the basis of what we call promoter proofreading. It sets a limiting lifetime for an initiating complex. Uh, the polymerase must attempt the initiation of RNA synthesis many times before succeeding, and unless the complex is stabilized through interactions with the general factors, it will disintegrate uh, and no proper transcription ensue. The reason why this is important is because helix unwinding events are very frequent. DNA uh, in uh, nature uh, undergoes thermal unwinding at a very high frequency. Incipient transcription bubbles uh, will occur in many locations at random all over the genome. And if, as we have seen, the polymerase has a special affinity for a transcription bubble for a, reason of, a region of the DNA that is suitably unwound, then transcription would occur and would initiate at random throughout the genome. That would be devastating, uh, for example, for the uh, differentiated state of cells or for gene regulation in general. So promoter proofreading requiring the interaction of the general factors, such as B that I have just mentioned with RNA polymerase, is essential to stabilize uh, an initiation complex so that it survives many attempts at initiation uh, before the process finally begins. Now, then uh, I will just summarize briefly uh, what I have told you about factor B, RNA polymerase interaction, and what it tells us about the initiation of transcription. So what we have learned is that factor B escorts the Tata box DNA at minus 30 to the surface of RNA polymerase, positions the DNA appropriately so the active center lies directly above, so the uh, initiation site in the DNA lies directly above the active center cleft. Then uh, what we have surmised, if that is the location of DNA in the closed promoter complex, it's appropriately situated so that, situated so that when melting begins at minus 11, uh, the template strand can be led through the factor B tunnel to the active center uh, where transcription actually begins. Once it starts and a DNA and an RNA product uh, begins to be synthesized, as I have told you, it must, there must be repeated rounds of abortive initiation for, for a length of about five residues is made, at which point uh, the RNA will make a stable interaction with that element of the immunoterminus we call the B finger. At that point, there is a switch between the Lou Cromer structure and the earlier Bushnell structure, in consequence of which the interactions with the upstream region are released, and now the only one that persists is that of the RNA with the B finger, and that is finally disrupted when the RNA grows still longer and the B finger and the last interaction with this component uh, is uh, displaced. Thank you very much, Roger Kornberg.